you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we shall review Dark Reflection Spectre, a source book for Wraith the Oblivion. I shall present my thoughts and opinions on its presentation and mechanics to help you better decide whether this is the source book for you. Five weeks ago, I presented you a nice jolly top ten list finny where I shared with you some books in my collection that I enjoyed more than others. Roughly half of them were books I'd reviewed on the podcast before, some I never mentioned, and a couple were almost off-brand. One of these books is Dark Reflection Spectre, originally released the 1st of October 1995, placed under the Black Dog Aegis, books within the World of Darkness line, a rating that was meant for mature audiences. Yes, World of Darkness games have always been advertised for adult gamers, but as you'll soon see, the material in this book and other Black Dog book supplements are... extra. But before we dive into the book review proper, here are the rules to the Lore by Night book reviews. I will explore snippets of the lore, mechanics and rules found within the tome. I will look as to how they are presented and easily they are conveyed to new and old players alike. As this is a review written and presented by me, all thoughts and opinions are my own, so if you disagree with something I've said, that is totally fine. It does not mean that you are right and I'm wrong and vice versa. Finally, if my introduction wasn't clear enough, this episode is having a big old content warning splashed onto it. Whilst I usually leave those in the descriptions when needed, I believe a verbal warning is required also. As with my previous book reviews, I will start at the very beginning, which is the physical book itself, which currently sits nicely upon my lap. Unlike most of the books I've reviewed, this one is a soft cover, rather than a hard copy, so I can't copy and paste the same part of my previous script this time. The book is mostly black with light blue font, possibly turquoise, surrounded by the spoopy wraith border. I should point out that my copy is a drive through RPG copy, so the colour scheme may differ from an original copy. On the topic of quality, this leads me onto the artwork found within the book. With the exception of its gruesomely morbid story at the beginning of the book, I believe it is with the various illustrations that earned it the Black Dog Seal, which is something I say with very little understanding of how the system actually worked. If not, it certainly added to it, for the majority of the illustrations in this book are incredibly grotesque and excessively horrific. The second piece you see is what I can only describe as a badly stitched up bold amputee whose sad mouth is so shut. Its arm stumps are covered in nails, as are the impressively large genitals that are seen drooping on the ground. This is on page 6, which sets the tone in the loudest possible manner that spectres are some truly degenerative beings within the world of darkness. Then you have the mess that is on page 26, which I am not even going to attempt to describe to you, because not only does it make me physically ill looking at it and trying to work out what the fuck is going on, but it reminds me of a certain controversial film regarding centipedes that will probably get me removed from all internet spaces everywhere. Even its most tame art borderlines the mildly disturbed and is especially effective at moving the reader. I have fallen in love with the artwork in the Wraith the Oblivion books over the last couple of years, all of which I have found terribly moving, but I would advise readers with a weak stomach to avoid this book and stick with what is presented in Wraith the Oblivion 20th Anniversary Edition, as there isn't a fifth edition as of this recording. Now hold on to that thought, for I will address that later in this review. When you open the book and move past the story and the aforementioned chubby testicle ghost, you are greeted to the standard White Wolf introductory chapter that clearly and appropriately informs the reader what spectres are and how they are essentially the inverse of their wraiths many once were. Whereas the themes of most Wraith the Oblivion games focus on light and hope, spectres are creatures filled with despair, pain and agony, motivated by the whims of oblivion itself. As all these introductory chapters do, this chapter ends with a basic breakdown of what the book intends to cover and a handy little lexicon of some spectre-related terms. Chapter 1 thrusts the reader into the world of spectral culture, starting with what the various supernaturals of the world of darkness thinks of spectres, omitting the changelings for some reason, and it is not because they didn't exist then, as the first edition was released July of that year, 
1995. Reading these short paragraphs is an interesting read for any ST of other World of Darkness splats that want to try and include raves and spectres into those games, as it presents a slightly different way of thinking about them. The werewolf presented here, a nameless silent strider, presents spectres as a ghostly servant of the worm, whilst the vampire, a Ramona Giovanni, warns fellow necromancers of their power while stating they, the spectres, are defenceless to necromancy. We then learn of the inherent abilities of the spectres' disposal, such as the death sense and the different take they have on the death sight. The reader is told of the frightening mind hive and how they fight of their psyche, not for their shadow, for spectres and shadows are incarnate. Following this is what makes up the bulk of the chapter, their history and culture. Unsure how they are presented in the original core books and only have to go off what 20th anniversary presented, it was interesting to learn how this book described spectres being creatures essentially created when there was a clear distinction of life and death in the world of darkness, rather than just some wraiths losing to their shadow. This distinction is far more fascinating than what many may assume. I will admit that this is probably the most dry page and a half in the book, as some of the more established lore and terms may confuse less experienced readers as it did me. This chapter also goes into great detail about what exactly spectres do, the cultures they form, and their relationships slash connections with Oblivion, the Tempests, Labyrinth, and Void. Whilst it would be very crude to make immediate comparisons to the Sabata Vampire the Masquerade, it is very difficult not to see the cult-like similarities between these antagonistic forces in their respective world of darkness. I will say, however, those are the only similarities one can make, as there is a clear caste system at play with the spectres. One one that brings about more fear as the ones at the bottom are practically bad raves to describe it poorly, and omnipotent monstrosities at the top. One can imagine quite easily how the lower castes are tortured and bullied just for existing, which would certainly explain some of the more morbid artwork in this book. As for the castes themselves, they are the different types of spectres, doppelgangers, nephrax, shades, mortrites, striplings and malfeans. Each of these disturbs me on some level, such as the way striplings being children's spectres who died horrifically before the age of 10, that encouraged children in the skin lands to poke knives and toasters and run into heavy traffic, topics that easily disturb parents and anyone with a decent moral compass. Then there are the Malfeans, who are just giant hungry gods that just cause chaos whenever they wake up from their deep slumber, devouring all in their wake. Two different and distinct levels of horror, one more mundane and relatable, the other borderlines apocalyptic. Of course, the really frightening thing is the fact that many of the Malfeans do not operate like this, but just play the spectres against each other and the hierarchy of Stygia and beyond. Next we move on to chapter 2, which is all about character creation, which in this book would probably be more helpful for players that use the original versions of Wraith the Oblivion than those using the 20th anniversary edition, especially when you look at the powers and Arconi available in this book. Of course, there is nothing stopping you from including them in the newer version also. The chapter ends with some dramatic systems for storytellers to use for their players to cause trouble with Wraith NPCs, which is a pleasant transition to the third chapter in the book, which is titled Spectres and the Storyteller, i.e. this is the section of the book meant for storytellers wanting to run Spectre Chronicles. It covers a large area of ideas, themes and plot hooks, which I think is somewhat more helpful than what is presented in the 20th Anniversary Edition. It also addresses how Spectres make ideal villains for Wraith games, unpacking the different motives of the different casts once more, which also serves as inspiration for both player and ST alike. This chapter also presents character creation guides for creating the Spectre's psyche. Whilst it makes sense putting it here, talking about Wraiths wanting to transcend, I believe it would have made more sense putting this in the previous chapter, given that is the character creation chapter. Finally, we move on to chapter 4, which is the templates chapter. As I've never had to explain this sort of section in previous book reviews, I shall pop a cherry and do it here. Many of the older source books in the World of Darkness 9 left a chapter, or part of one, for template characters, so players could pick one up and just play it if they're not too familiar with the system or settings. In the case of this book, one player takes the reign of the Spectre, the main character, and the other controls the more morally bound Psyche, which has its own smaller character sheet. Each pre-generated character is, quite frankly, a deranged fruit loop on some level or another. Despite the complex themes detailed in the book, each concept doesn't take too much properly to understand, providing easy to read, useful advice that anyone can run rampant with.
Some of the listeners of this review may own Wraith the Oblivion 20th Anniversary Edition, which does have a fairly large chapter on spectres, covering everything described in this book in a slightly more logical structure and may be curious if this book is worth the purchase. I will start by saying that if you have Wraith the Oblivion 20th Anniversary Edition, you technically own this book as well, as large sections have literally been copied and pasted from Dark Reflections and into the big chunky core book that is the 20th Anniversary Edition, omitting the authors who wrote Dark Reflections as well. Now, I can't comment on the legalities of that for I am no expert in the field, but I think most will agree that it's incredibly disrespectful and a tad lazy. However, I would still recommend this book to players and storytellers of Wraith the Oblivion. Whereas the 20th anniversary edition of Wraith does a superb job at clearly informing the reader what spectres are, how they behave and more, the tone Dark Reflection spectre sets here is far darker and arguably more appropriate for the heartless creature spectres are. It makes for a more engaging yet equally disturbing read to learn about spectres through this short tome than it does through Wraith the Oblivion 20th anniversary edition, and it's worth the purchase for that alone. Dark Reflection Spectre is a short book standing at 80 pages long. A small book it may be, but it does not fuck about with you or make you guess its intentions. Dark Reflection Spectre is meant to disturb you in everything it says and does, and it is packed to the teeth with so much horribly brilliant information. The imagery through its writing and horrible drawings act as a morbid inspiration for anyone wanting to introduce spectres into any World of Darkness setting, whether they are an antagonist or as a player character. Despite being troubled souls wanting to end their pain and suffering, they are certainly not protagonists. And for those of you who are new to the Lord by Night brand and the reviews I occasionally do, I do not do out of 10 scores because they are subjectively pointless. One person's 10 out of 10 is another's 3 out of 5 stars, which is another's minus 42 out of 100, so I shall rate this book Sisters of Mercy out of 10, as that is just as helpful as a proper out of 10 score. To be kept updated, follow the Lord by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you will be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.